Good evening. Uh, I'm Virginia Tech Provost Thanasis Rikakis, and I'd like to welcome you to tonight's to tonight's Beyond Boundaries presentational conversation. Uh, when Tim Sands gave his installation speech as the 16th president of Virginia Tech, he said we would be an institution where dreams for a positive impact on humanity would be realized through innovation, commercialization, and entrepreneurship. Did anyone here imagine that that would take the form of Google drones flying chipotle burritos to faculty and students on campus? <laughs> Did anyone imagine that some of our top medical researchers will be establishing social equity as a key predictor of the brain's health? Did anyone imagine that Assisi University will be establishing digital humanities as a key predictor of success in life regardless of discipline? The pace of innovation has reached the point where we must prepare for a future in which our wildest dreams are possible. We are very fortunate to have a president who's developing a vision for Virginia Tech's next generation, a process called Beyond Boundaries. Tim Sands is a scientist, an educator, an inventor who has dedicated much of his career to advancing the impact of research and innovation in public education. We are very proud to have Tim and his wife, Dr. Laura Sands, a professor of gerontology, and their four children as members of the Virginia Tech community. Tim is leading us on an exciting journey, and I'm looking forward to this evening's conversation about our future. Please welcome Virginia Tech's president, Tim Sands. <laughs> Thank you, Thanasis, and it's so great to see uh, so many familiar faces in our, in our audience here and realize that this time of day is a, is a difficult one, late sun, uh, Sunday evening, but uh, I'm glad you're here. And to our WebEx group, there are a lot of folks uh, joining us on WebEx, uh, we're glad to have you and we're looking forward to the Q&A after we have a, a bit of back and forth. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome tonight's Beyond Boundaries speaker, Kent Fox, uh, president of the University of Florida. From the day that we began the Beyond Boundaries initiative, uh, the dialogue is an important part of the process. And we've heard from many great faculty, students, staff, alumni, partners, and community leaders over the last uh, 10 or 12 months. But tonight we had the opportunity to add another voice uh, to the conversation, and I know from my experience that we can benefit from his insight. Our speaker today is in a position to understand our current journey. Less than two years ago, uh, he became president of a major public land-grant university, one that traces its roots to the uh, 19th century agricultural college. He's been engaged in rapid innovation, hiring new faculty, developing new budget models, and expanding programs beyond the original campus boundaries. He's a former provost. He's an engineer and a professor, having held leadership positions in the School of Electrical and Computer Engineering, and is a fellow of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. He also enjoys engaging in social media. His wife is a noted scholar, and they have four children. So, anybody who knows me may wonder if I just introduce myself, <laughs> because all those apply. But uh, Kent has had a different uh, set of experiences than I have. We've overlapped through our careers. But um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Uh, actually, Kent recruited me to, uh, to Purdue from Berkeley 15 years ago. And we had a chance over dinner to reminisce. He told me some stories about the backside of that that I didn't know. Um, none of them are too embarrassing, but, but, uh, but it, was a, it, was a, it was a good conversation. But it is very true that uh, Ken Fox and I have a lot in common. As president of the University of Florida, he shares an understanding of the modern land-grant mission. As a former provost of Cornell University, he has a deep understanding of academic priorities. And as a former dean of engineering at Cornell and head of Purdue's School of Electrical and Computer Engineering, he recognizes the importance of innovation and discovery. Kent earned his doctorate in electrical and computer engineering from the University of Illinois. And uh, something I find very intriguing, and perhaps we'll talk about it, he has a Master of Divinity from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School in Chicago. And uh, I, I know we've talked about that a little bit. I've, I've often regretted that I didn't have the opportunity to earn a divinity degree or something similar, because as a former provost and now as a president, uh, the kinds of conversations you have sometimes make you think you that's a it should be a requirement of the position, but, but Kent uses it well, and, and, and he may tell us a little bit about that. 
Uh, something that those of you in the audience who have been involved in inclusive VT, sort of a little backstory here is that Kent was one of the people that we called uh, at the beginning of that initiative to understand uh, his experience because he had changed the model uh, at his previous institution and we uh, benefited from his insight. So let's give a, a warm hokey welcome to President Kent Fox. It's good to be here. Well, it's great to have you, and you know, we have so much to talk about. I, I have a long list of questions that I would like to, uh, to, to uh, perhaps throw at you. Uh, we probably won't get to all of them, and we do want to save a little time for a Q&A. We're going to have two microphones set up, so at about uh, 40 minutes or so, we'll invite you to participate, and we'll also be taking questions from the WebEx uh, audience as well. Uh, let me start off. Uh, I want to make sure we get to the social media thing later, but uh, let me start off with a very general question. It's something we haven't had a chance to really talk about, and um, uh, I think I'm just curious as to what, how you reflect on this. You've been a faculty member at four of the great land-grant institutions at Illinois, at Purdue, Cornell, and Florida, now, four of our really uh, premier institutions. Uh, in some ways, these are very different institutions, and, and you know better than anybody how they are different. But I'm wondering if, because of your experience, uh, you might be, I know you're in, in a position to be really uniquely qualified to uh, comment on what attributes these four institutions share beyond their formal ties to the Morrill Act. Is there something like a, a way of thinking, a culture that, that you see that stretches across all four of those yeah. very different institutions? Yeah. There is something special about a public research university and something even more special about a university that was indeed created, you know, with uh, Senator Morrill and Abraham Lincoln in the mid-1800s. Um, and now I'm at one of the, the top uh, land-grant universities as well, so there's, they're now number five. Um, there's one more connection to Virginia Tech that I should mention that President Sands didn't mention, and that is that my daughter-in-law is uh, a graduate of Virginia Tech, and my son is as well. So I spend a lot of time on your campus as a parent. I've uh, mm -hmm. been to commencement. I've been to uh, 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 the, the uh, introductory sessions. I don't know what you call them here for parents. And uh, so it's, it's really good to be back, as well as obviously a great admirer of your College of Engineering, just on my own technical side and having visited it several times. Um, so there, there, there really is a, uh, a, both a, uh, a heritage, a mandate, and also a, a mission uh, for the present that, that comes with universities that, that uh, share not only the fact that they're, they are the, the university of, of their state where students can get an education uh, that's equal to any university in the world and the faculty are doing research that's equal to any university in the world. In addition to that, the, the university has a mission to the state and all of the five places, Virginia Tech, and the four where, where I've worked uh, and one where I work now, I'll share that and they all celebrate it. And each one a little bit differently, but each one just really, really celebrates that. Um, and I, I think we're gonna talk about how, how that translates into to the present, but it, it's something that, that uh, when I talk about it, at, when I talked about the land grant mission at Cornell or at the University of Florida, I remind our faculty and our students that it's not limited to to agriculture, it's not even limited to fields like engineering, it's even for the humanities and the arts that mm -hmm. we have a, a special mission to the citizens of the world, not, not, just, not just the state. And translating that into something that the broad public uh, understands is, is something that I think all of us share as a responsibility. So they understand why it is so important for us uh, to be within our states and to be supported, supported by our states. So something that I celebrate. I didn't purposely pick four land-grant universities to work in, but I'm really grateful that, I, that I've had that privilege. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have a similar feeling about it. I started off with an institution that had lost its land-grant charter, had given it up to uh, some sister institutions. And I saw, because you haven't been at, I guess, a non-land-grant, I did see a big difference when I moved to my first land-grant in terms of the sense of engagement and the fact that 
the faculty effort was divided differently. And, and part of it we don't get credit from, for uh, from, I think, the rest of academia. They don't understand that the outreach and, and engagement mission is really cr a critical part of what we do, and we're not going to give that up. Uh, so that's always a, a tension. I, I, I don't know if you've um, experienced that, but it's, uh, it's very special to be in a land grant. So yeah. you've had four wonderful yes. ones, and five if you include your your role as a parent. It is, so. it is. You know, there, there are about 4,600 colleges and universities in, in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, about of that group, only 1,600 are, are public. Uh, the rest are either private, for-profit, or private, non-profit. Uh, and, uh, and then you narrow that down to about 300 of those are doctoral research universities. Uh, and then about 100 of those by the Carnegie classification mm -hmm. are the, the uh, what they call the highest research in their, their latest nomenclature. Uh, and then you divide that down further uh, to the land grants. Um, it is, it's a, literally a small number amongst mm -hmm. the 4,600 uh, in this mm -hmm. country and mm -hmm. the tens of thousands around the world uh, that, that we are a part of. Mm -hmm. You know, despite our, our very strong uh, role with the state, and I think our, our states typically, if you go around the country, there's a lot of respect for the land grant institution or institutions in that state. Uh, so I feel, I know when I go to visit the General Assemblies of whatever state I'm in, uh, there's a respect for the land grant or land grant institutions that get you in the door that I think is, is, is special. Nevertheless, uh, over the past 30 years or so, in most of our states, and you may have a little bit of an exception in Florida, but most of our states have uh, disinvested in, in the public universities, including the land grants. And uh, it's all very transparent. We can look at the numbers and, and it's talked talk about openly. But uh, we've seen, for example, at Virginia Tech, uh, the, the amount of money that the state invests on a per student basis for in-state students has decreased by about a factor of two in real dollars over the last 15 or 16 years. It's stabilized now. It's kind of hit at a very stable point. But it's about a factor of two below what it was 15 years ago. And, and I've, I've been thinking about this a lot because it's a uh, it's a major subject in Virginia right now, a conversation about affordability and, and access. And if you think about the dynamic in here, um, th this has resulted in higher tuition rates for in-state students, at least in, in many states. And, and I think Florida is an exception, um, which is good. Hopefully it can stay that way. But uh, it's prompted a consumer mentality among parents and the students. And, and if you think about that, it's, it's a legitimate uh, perspective because your, the, the students have more skin in the game than they did 15, 20 years ago. So they expect more amenities, they expect more value from their, their education, and that further drives up the, the, the cost of education, which drives up the, the tuition. So the, um, this is a, um, a positive feedback loop, I guess, to put it in electrical engineering terms. And then we've got the regulatory and compliance costs that are added on top of that. So. I'm just wondering if you, I'm sure you've thought about this, but how do you, um, how are we going to break this cycle? Because this positive feedback loop doesn't end well. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we know that the disposable income for many of our, our citizens has not increased at this rate. What, do you have, can you share any thoughts with how you're, you're thinking about the long term for the University of Florida in this regard? Yeah, the, the, the institution I was before the University of Florida was the model, as it is for many, many privates, uh, including non-research privates, was very driven by a real high tuition, $50,000, um, but then a, a lot of need-based aid. Um, some privates, are is, the aid is not need-based, it's just merit-based, but it, Cornell was on need-based. So it was high tuition, but then a need-based aid. Um, that's a, definitely one model, but there's a huge debate there about uh, how, hard, how hard you can push the tuition, and I think the publics are beginning to see that as well. Just give you an example, at Cornell, when I was there, um, each year it was difficult to, to bring forward to the Board of Trustees the, uh, the proposal for the tuition increase, uh, harder and harder because they saw this com compounding uh, tuition rate. Um, and one statistic that's interesting, in 50 years, five zero years, the university had never had a tuition increase of 4% or lower. So it had always been higher for 50 years. Um, and that's how you get from some low tuition, 50 years in the past, up to something that compounds. Um, so that was the model there. And uh, again, the question there is just how, what's the run rate? How much mm -hmm. further can you get to 100,000 per year? Uh, 
And uh, so it, that's the challenge there. University of Florida is, is almost the flip side. Um, University of Florida has the cheapest tuition around. Um, now, I wish it was higher, but it was, it's, a, it's half of yours. It's half of Virginia Tech's. It's, uh, it is about 30% lower than any university that, that we track, uh, and Iowa State would be the, the next one above us. That's 30% <laughs> higher, roughly. So it is uh, at $6,000 a, a year. And then the students there have uh, merit-based aid. So if you're uh, a family uh, that comes to the University of Florida and you have, you, you know, you've sent your students and they've, they're, they're doing well with advanced placement, it's basically free um, because of the merit-based aid and, and tuition of 6000 What's dominating us is just the, the rest of the cost of attendance, the, the housing costs, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the cost of living uh, and uh, food and dining. Um, so tuition has become zero. Um, I don't know, this, sometimes it makes people feel better when you tell stories where it, it's more challenging elsewhere. Um, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences uh, had a project, and I believe you had Mary Sue Coleman here mm -hmm. uh, as yes, one of your speakers. Mm -hmm. um, she's wonderful. She, you know, she's been a president at the University of Iowa the, uh, and also the, the University of Michigan. Neither of those are, are land grant, but they're, they're wonderful universities. Um, but she and, and uh, former Chancellor Bob Bergino chaired that Lincoln Project. And in one of the five books, the booklets that they produced, there's a chart at the end of it where they're talking about the budget model, or I should say the business model, the business model for public research universities. And they take the, the uh, sum of the state allocation per student and the tuition per student, uh, those added together, and then sort it by state. Uh, state 50 was Florida. So, uh, and, uh, so that was our challenge. Now the state in the last several years has been uh, has not let us raise tuition, but they've been much more generous on, on their side. So we, we're no longer at that number 50. We're, we're moving up. But um, it is uh, something that for us is, it, that's the challenge for our, our business model is very simply. Now, when I look in the future, uh, which was your question, mm -hmm. Tim, mm -hmm. it is, uh, to me, uh, and we were working on this at Cornell as well, you, we have to be, think about revenues that we had not thought about before. So one example at Cornell, and, and I'm, I know you all have been there and, and done that to some degree, but at Cornell there were virtually no professional master's degrees, none. And, and our tracking appears uh, that was something that other institutions were using to bring in revenues as well as serve, serve society. So that was starting as, as I was leaving, creating uh, more robust uh, professional master's degrees in the areas outside of engineering in the areas that did not, not have them, uh, with some resistance from the faculty, because that, that, this takes effort and time, and it doesn't necessarily contribute to your, to your, your research productivity. Um, and uh, we were beginning to have discussion, and this I think is uh, something that we all should consider, about the model of what kind of faculty member we're gonna have in, in, the, in the future. Um, when I was a young faculty member many years ago, uh, you had to be, triple threat. You had to be good at teaching, you had to be great at research, and you had to do something of significance uh, outside of, of that, that that made a difference. Service to your, to your technical area or service to the, to the country in some way that the people understood that you were giving back. Do all three of those things. That it may be for the future that faculty will look a little different, um, and uh, they may be faculty that will indeed uh, engage in one of those areas uh, more effectively. Or maybe there'll be faculty that engage in, in the public press. Um, mm -hmm. I took one of, our, one of our faculty, just had a book um, on the long list of the National Book Award. Um, and he's a brand new assistant professor, so i just been at the University of Florida for a year. So I took him out for coffee uh, two weeks ago and was just talking to him because certainly now people are going to come try to steal the guy. And, um, and he was really worried about whether the popularity of his book that he has, this nonfiction fiction book in history, is gonna hurt his tenure case. It's gonna hurt it. And I said, uh, well, it better not, because you're making us famous uh, by, by what, you're, what you're doing, uh, taking your scholarship and addressing a, a public uh, issue. This, the issue was, was, is racism uh, that his book is about. And uh, that, to me, should contribute to uh, celebrating that person's success. 
Uh, but, I, but I think a different type of faculty member. Um, I also think, and there, there's a healthy balance, you all, of, of I, I believe, uh, student loans as well as tuition as well as financial aid. We all are working hard on growing our endowments. Uh, uh, and mm -hmm. that, that is, both of the Virginia Tech and the University of Florida are relatively young. And that's a conversation we may want to explore, Tim, but it is, uh, our campuses look like they're, they've been here a long time, but in comparison to many other universities that have been working on growing their endowments and growing philanthropy, we've only been doing that at the University of Florida for several decades, uh, while many of the other universities have been out there doing it for about a century or, or more. Uh, and that is a whole area, I think, of opportunity for University of Florida and for, for Virginia Tech as, as well. Um, so, well, we're, we're, I think we're having almost the, exactly the same conversations about the role of faculty and creating new pathways for faculty that may yes. move from a focus on teaching and learning to a focus on research or vice versa, that we're trying to create a more fluid um, system so that we can use the strengths of the faculty in, in the way that, they're, uh, that resonate with the faculty's desire mm -hmm. to uh, have impact. But uh, one of the things that I think is changing in addition to what you mentioned is we're seeing a receptivity, especially in industry, but also with other organizations, to forming long-term deep partnerships with the institution. Mm -hmm. And more and more uh, indus industries coming in and saying, and it's consortia usually, coming in and saying, and they could be formal or informal, we want to work with you on this program and we're going to help you with your curriculum and we're going to help fund it and we're going to give internships to your students. And it's hard to say no when, when you have a partner like that that's going to come in and, and sort of bridge that gap for you. Uh, but, uh, but there is that risk, and our faculty discuss this as well, that uh, we lose some of our autonomy, we lose some of our ability to, uh, to be, to be uh, nimble and flexible. It, it, and uh, I'm wondering if that conversation has happened or is happening at University of Florida or other campuses you've been on. I suspect it was happening at Cornell, but... but. <laughs> In, in different ways, mm -hmm. in different ways. Um, mm -hmm. we, we have a, a college of journalism and communications, and I, uh, we didn't have that at Cornell or, or, and I don't think Purdue had one either, right? Journalism mm -hmm. and no. communications. And that was a, a college uh, that was uh, you know, in, at, at risk because of the way the world is changing around uh, journalism of uh, becoming ir irrelevant. And so before my time, they did something really, I think, that was brilliant. They brought in a person from industry that really didn't have classical academic credentials as the dean, mm -hmm. as the dean. I'm not sure how, how I would have felt as a faculty member, but she just really transformed that, that college, made it relevant. She's relying on her associate deans to, to, to manage the, the academic piece. She doesn't get involved in those things, but she really has you know, added visibility, brought, made them relevant in New York City and the media markets in, in Los Angeles in a way that is uh, quite different than the world I lived in when I was a mm -hmm. young faculty member, where it was just the classical way, way forward. And uh, there, there are a lot of risks in doing that. Um, uh, I'm, I'm glad the University of Florida did, uh, didn't hire an industry person as president. I'm glad they hired a classical <laughs> academic. But, but the dean was good. The dean was a good idea. That's good. <laughs> uh, we could go on and on about that. But uh, uh, I wanted to sort of pivot a little bit because um, it's onto a topic that's really important for Virginia Tech and was certainly for Cornell, and I've learned in a brief conversation, also important for the University of Florida. And that is that many of our land-grant institutions were founded on frontier and agricultural land that was not only available, but it, but it met the mission. It was really uh, there for, to support the, the, the land-grant mission, not just the agricultural mission, but the, the engineering mission, if you will. We needed land, we needed, we needed space. Uh, and while that, actually is continuing to grow in importance. As a matter of fact, in, in Virginia, the agricultural economy is the biggest piece of the economy. So we're doubling down in, in, in what might be considered traditional land grant areas, but with a modern focus. But that said, the populations that we serve are, are moving towards cities. And, uh, and the land grant mission, if you look back to the original concept, and don't put it in 1862 language, but put it in 2016 language, uh, we've got to be in the cities too. We can't just do it all out in the country. And so I'm, I'm wondering how, what your thinking is about that transition from a strictly rural land grant to a, or even a suburban land grant to a, uh, a mix of an urban land grant, still retaining the, uh, the rural and suburban characteristic, but, but moving toward the urban. And you've been involved in 
Um, in fact, we're a key driver in the Cornell Tech uh, experiment, which is ongoing and actually thriving in New York City. And many of you remember um, Mayor Bloomberg giving, was it 100 million that he pledged? And then you got a very large gift of 350 million, I believe, uh, and have now created an anchor for Cornell out in Ithaca in, in, uh, in New York City. Uh, we have the opportunity in the National Capital Region, and we've, we've had roots there for a long time, but we're talking about this binary star concept where Blacksburg and Roanoke become one element of it and the other elements in, in the National Capital Region. Not, not to discount the presence in all the counties and cities, but, but there's a real opportunity for Virginia Tech. I'm just wondering if you can share some of your um, advice, uh, maybe um, cautions about from, from your experience with Cornell and, and now your experience with the University of Florida and how you make that transition toward a footprint in an urban environment. Yeah, it's, it, it's a, a nuanced question because um, we, we are even in discussions about our extension offices. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we have an extension program like you all do. We, there are 67 counties in the state of Florida, um, and we have offices in all of them, as well as 13 teaching and research stations around agriculture scattered around the state. Um, but one central campus, just one campus in, in Gainesville, but all these other programs, most of them agriculture, but not all agriculture. And as we talk about just those extension offices beginning to develop programs that are relevant, if they're you know, out uh, west of Miami uh, or in Homestead, you know, is there a way that that could benefit Miami or Fort Lauderdale or even further up the coast and the other counties? We're getting a lot of pushback from the agriculture community. I just met with the Farm Bureau with their board of about 50 members of their board and there are 200 commodities in the state of Florida and they're just not so uh, eager for us to tar start uh, serving the city folk uh, with these extension offices. But I just feel that it's really important that we double down on serving the agriculture community um, in ways that are going to be relevant to the future, but also be really relevant to the urban communities, because that seems to be the right mission for land-grant universities to, to do both and, and to do it well through, I would say, these extension offices. Um, and in other ways that not just classical agriculture, but we're, we're getting pushed back and we're, we're, we're working through that. Um, I've lived in each of these four universities. They've, always, they've all been rural communities, uh, kind of like Blacksburg, uh, the most rural though being Ithaca. Um, uh, Gainesville has about roughly 200,000 people, maybe slightly less. And when I first moved there the first year, everybody apologized by how, how small it was. Well, I think it's 30,000 people, so it was a big city for me. And Urbana-Champaign, Illinois, is, and, and West Lafayette, Indiana are, are much larger. Um, I, I do believe, for, at least for Cornell, and at least for the University of Florida, they also need visibility in the urban environment. So not just the extension offices serving the metropolitan areas, uh, but some really high profile visibility in a target urban environment. And uh, what you all have with the opportunities uh, in the regions surrounding Washington, D.C. Are, are, to me, sound really quite, quite special. Um, and for Cornell, it indeed was New York City, which is crystal clear uh, because of programs that were already there and it was the closest urban environment. It was four and a half hours away, but still the closest. Um, and uh, through country roads, not even an interstate for the first part of it. So um, it, we're, at Cornell, the opportunity was uh, to indeed take advantage of, of Mayor Bloomberg's vision. He, he saw the, the city of New York as having 50-year cycles in its, in its economy. The first 50 years was it was a port city. Uh, then the next 50 years was that it was uh, a manufacturing city. Um, and then the current 50 years that, that it's in, I'm not sure if it's in the middle or where it is, but that 50 years is what we know today. It's, it's finance, it's media, it's, it's fashion, the things that we, we love, entertainment in, in New York City. But he did not believe that that was going to be what, that what was going to drive that economy of that city forever. And what he saw was that was lacking was a, a tech economy, a, a tech sector or a tech ecosystem. Um, and so he created what he called, uh, through the Economic Development uh, Corporation of the city, uh, a, an applied sciences initiative. That's how he described it. Um, and then had a, a bunch of universities 
uh, that competed for it. And the idea was, was very simply not to take the intellectual property that, that would come out of a, an applied sciences campus and use that to start companies, but to educate students that would create companies in New York City and, and uh, f create this ecosystem to, to, to grow. He wanted what, what we all know about at other places around the country, and, and he saw that missing in, in what was there. That's a pretty bold statement to be the mayor of a city that has Columbia University and NYU and the City University of New York, and to say, I'm gonna bring somebody else to town to help drive this. Um, so, but for us, at, excuse me, at, the, at Cornell, it was obvious that that was something we had to pursue, so we did that really aggressively. At the University of Florida, it's not quite as clear that, that there's one environment. A, a previous president at the University of Florida thought Jacksonville was going to be the city. It's the closest. It's a little over an hour's drive from, from Gainesville. It has great connectivity with airports. And so we actually have a, a hospital there, University, UF Health it's called. Uh, but it's not, not working for us. It's not, it doesn't have the, the luster. It doesn't have the opportunities, the business model. Um, and Jacksonville's a wonderful city, but it's clear to us it's not the, the city that is going to drive the reputation of, of the University of Florida that can have the, the core campus being in Gainesville than another urban site. So we've, we've chosen Orlando mm -hmm. as, as the site. It's complicated because we have, in contrast to you all, we have a, the second largest university in the entire country resides in Orlando. It's called the University of Central Florida. They have almost 70,000 students at UCF. Um, but, uh, but they have welcomed us to come, UCF has, to be there in the biotech area. Um, and uh, so we're working on that. It's complicated. We need approvals uh, from, from the city and the state. And we have about 90% of those. And we're, we're still optimistic we'll be able to do that. But there's 30 acres of land uh, near the airport. And uh, we, again, already have a presence on part of that. Uh, but the idea was to grow it significantly. Um, and there we'll have to be a partner with, with UCF and, mm -hmm. and others. We can't, because we're part of the same system, can't, can't be a competitor. But ag again, it's the same kind of idea. You have a marvelous land-grant university in a rural setting that's just an amazing place for students to come, to study, get a degree, uh, for faculty to live and grow their families and do amazing things. But I just think you need to complement that when, when I look 100 years from now with an urban presence as well. Um, not to have a, a per se a, a replication of the two campuses, but uh, something that's focused, that's a bright light, that brings luster and, and will, will uh, give you connections that you wouldn't have otherwise. Mm -hmm. and, and I wish Washington DC was, was closer to Gainesville. <laughs> <laughs> Stay out. <laughs> no, just kidding. Uh, one of the things with land grants is we're kind of restricted by our state boundaries. And so uh, we have the city who, the, that, that uh, is in our state to, to think about and to engage with. Uh, so I think there's a lot of parallel uh, opportunities here. And uh, we're fortunate, I think, both states to have, uh, have that opportunity. Some states don't have a major city in, yes. in their, uh, near their land grant. So uh, we'll have to follow each other's experiment and, and trade um, knowledge as we go. But, but it was uh, wonderful to watch you work into, into New York City. And I've had a chance to visit Cornell Tech and, and very impressed with the, with the plans and with, with what's been achieved so far. I mean, one of the things you mentioned earlier is that, that when you're building something from scratch, you can do some things that are um, a little more modern or a little more um, a 21st century. But at the same time, you have to keep it connected to the home campus. You can't do it separately. No. And so these are, the, these are the kinds of conversations we're having here. There's a lot of effort that went into convincing the faculty in Ithaca that it resources weren't going to get drained. Um, mm -hmm. I, I would say, though, that it, um, there can be also a sort of a, a magical combinations of um, not just the opportunity, but also resources that come. Uh, so the, the, there was one large donor that mm -hmm. gave the $350 million, but uh, this was an individual that had given lots of resources in the past through his foundation, but um, it, it began to fund other things outside mm -hmm. of the university. But there was, it was that, that campus that attracted him back. Um, and I, I, the campus would not have happened without that gift. Uh, mm -hmm. And secondly, I don't think the gift would have happened without the campus. 
And so that, that was one piece of it, but a really important piece. And so that, things of, of those natures, when they, come, when they come together, can be quite, quite special. So, you know, when we started, we, didn't, we had no idea how we were gonna fund it. And uh, we knew the city had possibly 100 million. They, were, they mm -hmm. kept their cards kind of close. We knew there was land, but that's all we knew. And, uh, and uh, we had to make huge commitments. And so uh, it, you know, coming out of it, um, indeed, uh, there was a gift to, to endow uh, from the Jacobs, the relationship with Technion of over $100 million. Uh, there was a, a gift later, uh, in fact, from Mayor Bloomberg himself, in addition to what the city gave mm -hmm. of, of $100 million. And all, again, it was that synergy where you have um, a special opportunity that attracts uh, a, a special enthusiasm from people of means in this case, um, as well as the city. So mm -hmm. uh, that that sometimes we're I think we're we're kind of limited. At least I have been in my leadership roles limited by what resources I have. And I've also been on the side where we've overstretched on our resources, spent money we we didn't have that we shouldn't have spent. So the magical combination is when you have the vision that comes together with the resources. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Doesn't always happen, but when it does, it. You, you have to quite, jump on it when it happens. You do, yeah. yeah. A little, little different line of, of uh, conversation. Uh, you know, Virginia Tech, and I know University of Florida is as well, is strongly committed to creating an inclusive campus environment that encourages free but civil speech. But the national dialogue, of course, is uh, based on the premise, I think, of offensive speech and free speech are, speech are somehow connected, that you, in order to have true free speech, you have to be offensive, <laughs> and that may be overstating it, but, but there's, that, there's that sense out there. At the same time, our uh, public, primarily white institutions, our campuses are becoming symbols of economic and racial inequality, and just wondering if that keeps you up at night, like it does for me, and what are you doing at the University of Florida to get ahead of this growing sense that the uh, reality on our campuses and in our communities is far from what we espouse as a societal ideal. Even, even going back to the Morrill Act and its uplifting of what was called then the industrial classes, albeit the white industrial classes. Yeah, the, um, uh, you all probably remember this past year, there was a, a horrific shooting in Orlando uh, mm -hmm. in the Pulse, Pulse nightclub. Yes. Um, and um, it uh, affected uh, all of the state of Florida, but particularly those that, that had uh, college students. And so that, that week um, after that, we, we had no students or staff uh, or employees that, that were harmed in that shooting, um, but it affected our campus a lot. Um, and so we had a, um, uh, and it was very much targeted at the LGBTQ community. Uh, the night of the shooting was, was a night where there was uh, uh, Latino uh, young people there um, and, um, and so it affected those communities really profoundly. And then right on the heels of that were the shooting of the African-American young men by police and then the Dallas shootings of the police. Uh, it, was, it was a tough couple of weeks together there um, in, in the summer. We, um, uh, we have a, a tower on the center of our campus called Century Tower. So we lit that tower with rainbow colors for a couple of weeks right up until 4th of July and then changed it to uh, red, white, and blue. But that week, that first week after the Pulse nightclub shooting, I, I met with um, our African-American staff that were, um, remember that was also the week of the shooting by police of, of young African-American men that was on face, Facebook Live and other things. So met with the African-American staff that were in our student services, our student affairs. Mm -hmm. There are about 40 of them that, that work with students in different ways. It was a tough meeting because they, they were relating all the experiences they had at the University of Florida of uh, feeling unwelcomed. Um, and these are the people that are helping our students feel welcome and are supporting our students. Um, so it was, a, it was a, a time for me to just sort of reflect on the community that we have at the University of Florida. Um, and, you're, and everybody was feeling threatened or, or unsupported, uh, staff, students, everyone else. Secondly, um, we took a, we did a, a climate survey this past year. It was the first one ever taken at the University of Florida. It took about a year to get it ready. Uh, we're still going through town hall meetings to understand and talk about what we're learning. Um, so we're, we're as a community, uh, the community of the University of Florida are really 
wrestling with, with these issues of, 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 of race, of um, uh, just the, all the issues that, that you can imagine, whether you're uh, a, a male Caucasian like me or, or no matter what your background, the community is really wrestling with it. Um, and both the faculty side, as well as students, as well as all of the employees. And then the city of Gainesville itself, itself is really divided, divided racially. The whole East Gainesville uh, was founded in the early 1800s um, are, and uh, is almost all African American. There are African American churches there from the 1850s and the West Gainesville is almost all Caucasian. So it's a, a community that's wrestling with this and working mm -hmm. through it and trying to figure out um, how we can be open, how we can be respectful, but learn from each other. Um, it's not a campus that has a history of, of protests, although there have been some of them. Uh, so it's just a matter of, for us of learning how to have good dialogue where we can from, learn from each other. We have work mm -hmm. to do in growing our, our diversity of our campus just in terms of the, the numbers of people that are there, including, including the, the financial uh, uh, diversity of, of our students. Mm -hmm. So there's work to be done, and I think we're all, we're all working through it, and we all have our, our stories. We don't have like one incident. It's like the whole campus is involved in this. It's yeah. a daunting uh, challenge, but because the microscope is on the, our campuses, yes. whether we like it or not, and, and I think the real opportunity is that if we can make headway on our campuses, the rest of the world might see a model, at least our communities. Uh, yeah. But we have to do it with the community, too. We, the, the bubble is not... Uh, is not real. It's it's we're integrated with our communities. So, yeah. So I th I think uh, we'll we'll both be busy with this for for many years to come. But it's it's good work. Uh, maybe the last question I have, and then we'll turn it over to Q and A. Uh, you and and I are both fairly active on social media. And I, I know when when I became a university president just a few years ago, uh, my kids basically told me, you have to be active on social media, and I was not at the time. And I, I, I approached that with quite, quite a bit of dread, but it's been a, uh, a great learning experience for me. I'm wondering what your experiences are and how that has changed the way that you interact with, with the communities that, that you serve um, as a president. Yeah, it, uh, so I, I checked out how many followers President Sands have, has. I have to get to work because he has a lot more followers. Well, I've been added a little longer than you <laughs> okay, have. Yeah. So, not many months, so um, I'm, I'm envious. Um, although I should say I, I was really proud at the University of Florida when I hit 5,000 followers. Um, uh, this is a while back. I have more now, uh, but uh, not a lot more, but more. Um, and then uh, somebody told me, this was early when I was there, they told me to uh, check out our basketball coaches. Yes, you don't uh, want to do that. Yeah. At, at that time, our, our coach was Billy Donovan, who had won a couple of national championships. And so he had a hundred and some thousand followers. And then, uh, and then, and I, so I was, that was going to become my new goal. Then somebody said they should, that, that I should check out our latest Heisman Trophy winner, which was uh, Tim Debo. Uh, three plus million, so so I have a ways to go. So, um, so <laughs> one thing I found though is that despite the numbers not being that that large, I mean, if you think about it, we probably have two hundred fifty thousand alums and yeah. maybe two or three million people who consider themselves Hokies. Uh, and my my set of followers is much smaller. But what I've what I've found is that the uh, the messages that go out on social media directly or indirectly seem to propagate by ways that I don't understand <laughs> yeah. beyond. They that, do. That they do. Several thousand. So have, have you been on Facebook Live yet? No, I haven't done that yet. Okay, so I did it Friday, So because I knew it was coming. I had mm -hmm. to do something mm -hmm. you didn't do. So last Friday I was, okay. on, last Friday I was on Facebook Live. Um, so you can watch it. It's now been archived if you want to, uh, if you have nothing else to do. I, I, I fear um, that that's so, going to appear on my agenda <laughs> soon. So I don't know what it is, but you look at a little iPhone and 10,000 people watch it. So. And they send you comments. They send you comments. Well, that, that, it it, yeah. it does. But I'm sure you found this as well, Tim. That it really does uh, enable you. I, I was I'd never been on Twitter until I started as a president, and they and they convinced me to try it. And what I had seen before was just presidents tweeting out what they had for breakfast, and then lunch and dinner, <laughs> and that they were going to bed. And I didn't really think that was that very presidential. So um, so, but it. What I found out, because as, as you do, I, I live on campus, um, mm -hmm. and it really allows you to have a conversation in, in, a, in, a, in a way that allows you to connect. And it's not so much the president, it's the president represents 
the university. The president represents the administration, re represents the faculty. And so the students, which are the majority, not all, but the majority of those that are watching you and interacting, say, wow, this person cares. Um, so when I, when I checked into the uh, hotel, the young lady asked me why I was here. And I said, well, I'm going to have dinner with your, your president tonight. And then I said, have you met President Sands? And, and she, said, uh, she said, oh, yes, I met him. Uh, we love him. He's awesome. Now, <laughs> probably it's his Twitter. <laughs> well, you know, that's, I was about to say that, 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 that I probably have met that individual. I, it's, if they're working at the, at the end, I probably have met them in person. But, but one thing I've noticed is that um, I, it, when I'm traveling and I'm not on campus yeah. and, I, and I tweet, and by the way, both of us, we found out, manage our own accounts. We don't have people tweeting for us. Uh, even though it's pretty clear that, that I'm not on campus, that doesn't matter to today's generation. They feel you're there. If you're tweeting at them and they're, they're tweeting back at you and there's a dialogue or they just see what, what's going on, they feel like uh, you could be 3,000 miles away. It does not matter. You are there. And uh, that is invaluable. So that, that is, part of that it is. I love. I also did something for the first time last week. You may do this every well, week. Wow, you're, you're, you're no, no, a few milestones is, ahead of me. No. I did. This is not social media, but I was on my first live call-in sports show last week. Have, have you done that yet? Uh, I've been asked to do those kind of things. It's been yeah, 17, yes, yes. Years, uh, 17 years at the University mm -hmm. of Florida since the president's done that. And now I know why. Now I know why. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, somehow we can't get it into the schedule. I don't know what. <laughs> well, let's turn it over to uh, questions from the audience and also from WebEx. Yes, yeah, since you guys were just talking about social media, I'll actually start off with a question we've gotten off of our at B VT Beyond Twitter feed. And uh, they ask, what type of faculty will be the faculty of the future? Mm -hmm. yeah, I think we, we touched on that. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a shot. Mm -hmm. um, you know, both of our, our institutions, as I said, are in the, the scheme of higher ed globally and, and also secondly, um, here in the United States, we're, again, we're relatively young. It's been in the six, mm -hmm. 1960s, 1970s, when both of our institutions said, we're not just going to educate people, but we're also going to be scholars of, of the world. And we're going to you know, have not just the, the best students in our state, but we're going to be a, a place where students from around the world come. And we're going to be equal to any other university. So both the University of Florida and Virginia Tech are, are working hard to raise what I call our stature. Our mm -hmm. stature. So I, I think. Uh, faculty here at the Virginia Tech and faculty at the University of Florida are, are going to be in the future ones that, that uh, not only their peers know about them nationally, but I would like to see faculty that the general public knows about. Now, not all faculty are going to write columns in the New York Times or, or do things, but, but I do think more public visibility and engagement with society by faculty will become more important. So faculty will have to develop those kinds of skills, which I've had to learn by doing it by mistakes, by making mistakes, engaging with the public in mm -hmm. whatever ways. It could be uh, in, on social media, but it could be more classically. And, and that will help, I think, our case mm -hmm. for why our society needs to invest in, 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 in these special universities. I, I couldn't agree more. I think it's a, there's a diversity of ways that faculty can, can fulfill the mission. They can't, we can't expect every faculty member to do um, exceptional work in every aspect of what it means to be a, a faculty member at all times. They might do it through the career, but not maybe all at once. But I've noticed um, we had a you know, remarkable um, experience with Mark Edwards and his colleagues in civil engineering going into Flint. And, you know, the last year or so, we've talked a lot about that experience that Mark had that was driven by his uh, passions for clean and safe drinking water for everyone. And it's the conversation, uh, I think, that is, it's not completely new, but it's much more elevated, is this, this sense of, especially for land grants, yeah. of having a, um, an aspiration for improving the human condition, being very out about that, not, 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 on, not just something you talk about around the yeah. dinner table or with your graduate group, but something that is publicly uh, accessible. And then building your depth in, in your discipline and your, your mm. interactions with teams mm. across the disciplines to allow you to go out and attack real problems 
alongside the, 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 the necessary work in, in building the, the base of knowledge. But I think that's a, a great frontier for, for all of us, especially the land grants, where we already have yes. that kind of mission or that DNA or whatever. Yeah. But just getting it out, exactly like you, you described, just getting it out there, making it more visible to the public. Mm -hmm. This is why you fund the, the public universities, is because they are actually making a difference out there. They're not, they're not just make, generating knowledge, which is critical, but, but they're, they're having an impact on uh, the human condition or having an impact on uh, economies. One of the things that I, I noticed, and, and you may have this experience in Jacksonville, you mentioned that it's not big enough as a city, but, but uh, we have a similar situation with Roanoke. And uh, the, when we make an investment in Roanoke, it makes a difference because it's a small city. Mm -hmm. And so you start to see this uh, feedback mechanism is a lot more transparent than it is in a big city. Uh, but uh, I, I think, I, th I, th I agree with you, I think our future is great as we uh, pivot toward being more publicly accessible to, to, yeah. uh, to yeah. those who, who pay the bills. I, I would say there, there, there are, um, well, I'd make two comments. One is there, there's a lot of risk. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll give you two examples in that uh, we have uh, had a very visible faculty and engaged in the GMO debate. Um, and uh, he's, uh, this is his area of research, uh, genetically modified organisms, but, and he's a, he's a plant scientist, but um, he's really been attacked. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, it's really, tough. personally, yeah. mm -hmm. in all kinds of ways, because that, uh, particularly in Europe and other parts of the world, but even here in the U.S., and even some of his colleagues uh, don't agree mm -hmm. with him. But he's been in that debate, so there's a balance there. And, mm -hmm. uh, but, um, uh, and then, and then uh, secondly, there can be political constraints, um, particularly if, if science may disagree with some, some political perspective. And so you have to do it with care, and, and, mm -hmm. and I don't mm -hmm. think um, all faculty members have to have headlines and no. And, and the papers every day. <laughs> I don't want to be in the headlines and papers every day. Uh, but, I, but I do think all of us, whether we're uh, uh, presidents or we're faculty members, need to communicate why what we teach and what our scholarship is about, why that's important. Even if we're a theoretician, even if we're in uh, any area, uh, arts and sciences, uh, humanities, social sciences, um, why is it that we teach a certain course? It, and hopefully what we work on are important things. It doesn't mean everything we do ends up in a product. Not at all, but it, it's important in some way. Otherwise, we wouldn't be working on it. We want, our, we want to all be working on important things, um, whether we're theoreticians or, or, or no matter what areas we're in. And I, I think communicating that, uh, why it's important, is good for us, but it's also good uh, and our university is good for the universities, but also good for society, for them to understand why liberal arts and other areas are, are important. Well, a lot of what we do is inspire, and our faculty yes. in astrophysics and paleontology and many other fields of the humanities, the arts, inspire people. Mm. This, those are the, mm. the, the ideas that, that yes. generate the next product, yes. if you will. So yes. I think we're, we're yeah. uh, heading into a great future there. Well, let's take another question. Good evening. My name is Dwayne Taylor, and uh, it's been a unique opportunity for me uh, and my wife here tonight because uh, we just uh, came to Virginia Tech earlier this summer. I'm mm -hmm. a new member of the facilities team, mm -hmm. and uh, we're former residents of Florida, and our daughter is a new freshman at University of Florida, so it's been very interesting to hear your perspective. Go Gators. Thanks. Does she follow uh, President Fox on I'll have Twitter? To ask her. Yeah. I'll have yes. to ask her. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's really exciting to be here at Virginia Tech as we explore what the beyond boundaries um, notion means to facilities and campus infrastructure and things like that. And I'm curious what your perspective is at University of Florida with regard to that. The, the infrastructure of the institution? A couple comments. I'm, I'm not sure that they'll, they'll add much. Uh, first off, I, I, I think Virginia Tech's campus is just gorgeous. I, I love your your hokey stone, is that, mm -hmm. is that the mm -hmm. word? Yep, yeah, I love that. It's the only place in the world where you can find our version yeah. of dolomite limestone. Yep, yeah. yeah. And that was part of what attracted my you can't son buy here. It. Yeah. 2000 and, uh, 2002. Um, it's just the beauty of the campus. And there's something important about a, a beautiful campus. Um, I, I'm one of those people that believes, indeed, we're going to do a lot more online education in the future. Uh, at, and, and I'm a huge technology optimist, but I love residential campuses. and. Uh, 
I'm biased because I've always worked at one, but it, it, there's, there's an, the, the physical beauty as well as the function of a campus are just so, so, so important. Um, the great challenge that most universities have, and I don't know how, what it's like here, but that have been at their, their location 100 years or more is our favorite term, uh, deferred maintenance. Um, we have that in, in just all kinds of ways, and it, it's hard to, to address that with, with uh, philanthropy. It's, it's hard to, to address it through, through uh, any way except for just purposely addressing the deferred maintenance piece of it. Um, so we're, we're pretty successful at the University of Florida in creating new buildings. We're not so good at, at maintaining our, our existing ones. And so that is uh, just a big bogey that sits out there that, that we talk about. And we, we don't yet have a solution for it. Um, we're, we're working with our state to help. Um, and, uh, but even then, it's, it's a hard, hard lift. Uh, but uh, but that, that for us is, is really important. But then there's the whole infrastructure of how do we become even more efficient and effective in our missions of education and, and scholarship and what, what buildings should look like in, in the future and how, how sustainable they're going to be. So there's just a lot of excitement around that and how that integrates. It's good to be on a, a campus, and you all have this to some degree, uh, where the weather is nicer in the academic year than, than it was up, up north where I was before. It, it changes the the environment in a positive way. Uh, the students are out and about. Our summers are spectacular, but we can't, you know, everybody takes a break. But uh, yeah. I'm just saying, it's, I love Blacksburg yeah. summers, but yeah. One, one, be one more question. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is uh, Ralph Fool. I'm on the faculty in the School of Public and International Affairs. And I'm very interested in hearing um, your thoughts on international campuses. And what is a strategy for sort of going global, expanding the, the land ground mission overseas. Uh, we have campuses in, in Switzerland, in India, and other places. And, you know, what are you thinking about you know, mm -hmm. taking that leap overseas? And how do you make a campus successful? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it, it is an area of, I, I think, um, opportunity when you look globally, internationally. But an area, you ha it, no matter what you do, you have to do carefully. You have to do carefully. Um, we're, we're having some challenges right now on campus in just managing some of the uh, engagement development projects that we, had, uh, that we have federally funded uh, because it's so difficult to, to have uh, processes in place internationally and watch those carefully. So we're on the compliance side, which, which I hate talking about or, or dealing with, uh, just just getting hammered right now because of we didn't have the right processes in place in other countries where we were doing some, some important de development work. Um, so there's a lot of risk internationally. Um, but there's a, a lot, there's even more benefit and, and upside. Um, so I'll start with Cornell's um, and then I'll, I'll mention the University of Florida. Um, at Cornell there had been uh, one campus uh, internationally that was significant and that was the the, the medical school had decided to go into Doha and to Qatar and to have a campus there, which is, exists and, and is flourishing. Um, there were other pockets of initiatives, as, as I'm sure you all have, and the University of Florida has. The architecture program had a, had a program in Rome in a, in a building, uh, but not, not a full campus where they were giving degrees. There was only one place where they were giving degrees. And we decided purposefully, when, when I was there, not to set up uh, any more branch campuses, um, but instead to have targeted relationships, targeted relationships. So we did that with the, uh, the new King Abdallah University of Science and Technology in, in Saudi Arabia, um, and, uh, and then we're uh, working with the Ho School of Hotel Administration in, in Asia. So very focused, and it's just not a branch campus. Um, the, the one thing we did that was unique at Cornell was to invite a, a international university to come to the US and, and to partner with us. Um, that usually it's the other way around. We're sending people uh, over, we're creating campuses elsewhere. So we, we invited uh, to this tech campus that we were talking about earlier, the, uh, the Technion University, which is uh, the, the equivalent of Virginia Tech, although much smaller, uh, in, uh, in, in Israel. Um, 
And even that, even though it was on our own soil, was not, not easy. It was challenging when you take two cultures and, and you're working out, giving uh, dual degrees and doing all those things. But, but I think something that, that was worth the effort, worth the effort. I do believe it's really important that we give our students international experiences, both by having them study and learn overseas, but also by bringing international students here that they can learn from. We have a very small uh, un international undergrad population at the University of Florida. At Cornell, it was 11% of our undergrads were international. At the University of Florida, it's been 1%, 1% of, and uh, to me, that means that the undergrad population at, at the University of Florida doesn't have the benefit of interacting with, with international students as they could if their roommate was from a different country or, or their lab partner was from a, from a different country. Um, we'll always have the majority of our students be University of Florida, or State of Florida students at the University of Florida, but I do think we have to grow these, the international students. Um, and then obviously there's just the initiatives of the faculty which are abundant and, and how do we support that as an administration is something we're, we're working on. Tim, did you have any thoughts on that? Or? Well, I, I add one thing. I mean, of course, a lot of our faculty are, uh, as they are in most land grants, are very engaged. Some of the people in the audience here are, I'm surprised they're in Blacksburg because I, I thought they were in Africa or Europe or yeah. wherever, uh, which is fantastic. And we have a lot of student, faculty-led student um, opportunities. But one of the things I just mentioned, because I, I would just repeat what you said for the most part, is uh, we had a Beyond Boundaries conversation with our graduate students and undergrads and our provost, uh, Thanasis Rakakis, and I were there. And uh, the conversation with, with hundreds of students around tables talking about the, the Virginia Tech, a generation from now, around this idea of the global uh, footprint was uh, much more ambitious than any administrator, even faculty member, I think, would dare think about. They, if I could summarize what I learned is our, our students envision campuses in, on every continent uh, for Virginia Tech and the ability to move between them fluidly. So you're, you're taking a course in, based in Blacksburg, but you're, 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 you may be in three continents in the semester and you're, you have the continuity of that course because the, the, the connections are there, the, the you can, you, yeah. multimodal uh, uh, delivery of the course, you can take it in, in, at any time of the day, and, and a sense of uh, being able to, to run around the world and always be at Virginia Tech when you need to be in the evening or whenever is something that, uh, that we haven't figured out how to do it, but it's a, it's a student aspiration, and it's an exciting one. It, it really, uh, I think, reflects that fact that this generation has a much different worldview than, than our generation. You know, we think of going around, going, studying abroad as a good thing, which it is. You go and you, you learn about other cultures, you learn how to immerse yourself. I think some of our students are, are even beyond that and they're thinking, I'm gonna live in this global environment, I'm gonna be bouncing around, I need, I, you know, I want Virginia Tech to make that easy on me. And, and, and I, of course I want to be, they always want to be back in Blacksburg on, on Saturdays in, in the fall. And I don't know why, but they always want to do that. But, but well, I think it's been a fantastic conversation. I want to thank you, uh, President Fox, for taking the time. And, uh, and I'm sure our audience, uh, WebEx audience, is, uh, is, uh, uh, has been engaged as well. And I'm, I'm sure we're going to get a lot of conversation started here, or we did get a lot started. So looking forward to keeping you close. and. I know you don't have any more um, uh, children coming to Virginia Tech, but uh, maybe the next generation, as it comes along, you can uh, move them our way. But it's I, been did, I did ask as my gift for coming uh, that I get some uh, gear for my grandchildren. So the, the, we're, we're taking Fantastic. it back. Fantastic. That orange and maroon, when they're really early, before they're you know, a year old, we're you got to get them an orange and maroon. Very good. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, Ken. You. Thank you.